Okay, come on, there we go. Okay, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. His name is Sean Levy. He is the author of a book that uh, came to my attention that looked very interesting. As somebody who lived in Los Angeles, it was definitely a fascinating uh, story. The name title of the book is The Castle on Sunset, Life, Death, Love, Art, and Scandal at Hollywood's Chateau Marmont, which is the story of a very prominent hotel in the city of L.A., Chateau Marmont, that uh, kind of reminds me of kind of a West Coast Chelsea Hotel in New York, kind of so many important cultural, uh, political figures. Many people have, have gone through there through the years then, uh, since it was built just before the crash of 1929. But he's also the author of many other books. One is Dolce Vita, Confidential, Fellini, Lauren, Pucci, Paparazzi, and the Swinging High Life of 1929, Nero Alike, which kind of ties into this story. The Rat Pack, Paul Newman, A Life, The Last Playboy, High Life of Porfirio, Ruben Rosa, and Ready, Steady, Go, The Smashing Rise and Giddy Fall of Swinging London, Rat Pack Confidential, and King of Comedy, The Life and Art of Jerry Lewis. So he's an accomplished author, and I'm delighted that he's taken time out of his schedule to talk about this book. So, Mr. Levy, are you there? I am. Hi. Hi. Well, I'm uh, thankful that you uh, decided to do this interview. I know we took a little time to kind of figure out a date, but for people who don't know your name, can you talk a little bit about yourself and what led you to the subject of Chateau Marmont? Um, I, I'm, you mentioned all the books. I've been publishing books since 1997, and um, for about 10 years earlier than that, from the late 1980s on, I was a ma film magazine writer and editor and a film critic at a daily newspaper in Portland, uh, The Oregonian, from 19... 97 to 2012, 1992, pardon me, to 2012. And I was a critic on TV. And you mentioned the books I've written. And I wrote a book about the Rat Pack in, 50, in you know, early 60s, late 50s, Vegas. I wrote a book about Rome in the 50s, which was a real pop culture um, melting pot. I wrote a book about London in the 60s. So I always wanted to write a book about the Sunset Strip, which to me, you go Rome, Rat Pack, London, Sunset Strip. And so for about 20 years or so, I've been gathering string on stories of it. And Chateau Marmont's right in the middle. And uh, when I was seeking a new book project um, in 2016, uh, I proposed my Sunset Strip book again, which I have done many times over the years. And the editors who I'd worked with at Doubleday, they, they weren't keen on it, but they said, what about the Chateau Marmont? So they had taken my proposal and boiled it down to one subject, and the whole book appeared in my head at once. Um, Chateau Marmont is uniquely situated physically, culturally, historically, and I wanted to tell the story of the Sunset Strip, and I could tell... A good 50, 60 percent of that book in telling the story of this hotel. Plus, I had this incredible treasure trove of historical stories, gossip, curiosities. So it was a very rich subject, and I saw it immediately when it was suggested. Yeah, and it, I mean, it really is a centerpiece. It's located right there off the Sunset Strip, right in between kind of the lower part of Hollywood and Hollywood Hills. And it's very prominent, it's distinctive in its architecture. Can you talk about how the conceptualization and how even the hotel itself was built? Yeah, it, you know, it was Sunset Boulevard was an unpaved road in the 1920s, and a, uh, a speculative uh, builder named Fred Horowitz um, bought a piece of land just outside the Los Angeles city limits. You know, if you drive west on Sunset Boulevard from downtown uh, past the Hollywood Freeway, it's basically a grid like Manhattan. It's a checkerboard. And you go through Los Angeles and Hollywood, and then you get to the line where Los Angeles City proper ends. And beyond that was the Sunset Strip. Horowitz bought like the first plot of land that was available on the west side of that border where the road starts to curve. And he bought a promontory and he put on it a castle. Uh, basically, he, he was in love with a chateau that he'd seen in France, which is happens to be where Leonardo da Vinci is buried. 
and he wanted uh, his architect to reproduce it in small form on this hillside. Again, it's an unpaved road. The city of West Hollywood exists virtually in name only. Um, and it's right there, like the Rock of Gibraltar. It's at the beginning of something. The, the road changes. The culture changes. West Hollywood was a wild town. It became a, a place of roadhouses and illegal gambling dens and uh, you know, after-hours joints. So here's Chateau Marmont with one foot in Los Angeles and one foot in this bohemian new little uh, village that still, as I say, wasn't paved. Right, and it's right there just west of Laurel Canyon Drive, right? And mm -hmm. so there, there's a lot of history there. And also at that time, you mentioned in your book, the Strip got, it was kind of a name of like honky-tonk bars. So the Sunset Strip always had that history of kind of a Wild West uh, element to it. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it, the, that neighborhood, there were mansions off the road, but they were to the south. You know, to the north, it was still the... If you're going west on Sunset Boulevard, everything to the right until you got to Beverly Hills was farmland, um, onion fields and, and, and uh, poinsettia groves and things like this. So whatever was built there, A, it wasn't policed by either Beverly Hills or Los Angeles police. It was policed by L.A. County sheriffs who were most of the time they spent on the other side of, of, of the metropolis. Um, so it was kind of lawless. Gangsters operated there. Um, the gangster Mickey Cohn owned a haberdashery on Sunset Boulevard in the 40s and was bombed. <laughs> and there was a shootout on the street in front of his store. So it's always been kind of like this in-between place and crazy place. Later on, it became a, a haven for Los Angeles' queer community. And it still is, like West Hollywood. Um, it's, it's still a remarkable place. And the Sunset Strip grew at, you know as the center of that city yeah and there was always kind of this uh that element you mentioned the place called the garden of allah which doesn't exist but that was also kind of a bohemian uh bacchanalia kind of debauched place as well can you talk a little bit about that and it's tie into chateau marmont yeah the garden of allah was the first sort of um hollywood no, no tell hotel high-end no tell hotel in the in the industry it was on the estate of the silent movie actress and stage diva um Allah, Allah, pardon me Allah nazimova Allah nazimova i'm going to try to give you a cut there it's a tough one yeah no problem yeah um you've read the book more recently than me that's for sure that's okay <laughs> um but i've always had stuck struggled with her name so i'm gonna turn to a but, page and have it in front of me but it was like there were that she kind of had this uh theme of small little places marx was there bogart yeah Lynn, yeah no i, I just I a just, bunch of scandalous it, people it was uh, built on the estate of the russian actress ala nazimova and she was she you know she, she was in a, a a lavender marriage with her husband they each had lovers on the side they were both queer bisexual um, practicing all kinds of free love. Um, she surrounded herself with painters and musicians, Igor Stravinsky, um, Picasso, all these people knew her. And in Los Angeles, she built parking garages and elevators. And every year, Armand was an apartment with, with a kitchen and a living room and, you know, at the very least, a small suite with a, a, a kitchenette. How, that's how people West Hollywood and right and I think that's interesting because most people would built originally as an apartment building not a hotel so it was right, transformed right. later yeah not for a hotel who would build a hotel on a dirt road it was to put it up scale apartments, mainly to the out-of-town wealthy trade. Most of the people he figured he would rent apartments to bloods from Santa Barbara and Pasadena and San Francisco who wanted Los Angeles, the way Russian and Chinese apartments in Manhattan. And 
that was the original idea, but he cut the ribbon on the place seven months before the stock market crashed in 1929. And even those wealthy people stopped looking for apartment rentals. Um, he sold it to a man who had a hotel, Al Alfred E. Smith, the movie business, who had become a later after selling his company to Warner Brothers. And um, that a hotel was a better um, this Burbank or Culver City West LA every movie and TV facility really conveniently um, he understood the movie to stay in a place like this so he, he turned it into a successful business as a hotel and some, I mean, at the at very early stages, there were very, very famous people who wanted to stay there, namely Billy and Harlow. Can you talk a little bit about them? Yeah, from, from you know, Horowitz sells in 1933 on celebrities and European and English and New York film people who came accustomed to the place. And it was funky. Even when it was new, they ran out of money for furnishings, so it was furnished and cheap. Um, after when the depression uh, closing people's mansions, Alfred Smith, the hotelier of the of the place, bought up estate furniture. So it was fu furnished in like antiques that didn't match, kind of not Hollywood. You know, if you wanted the ambassador. Um, these were big hotels on beautiful lush grounds. Chateau Marmont, you know, swimming pool. It was a single building. It didn't have common spaces like a hotel, lobby areas or a restaurant or bar. So people who went there liked it because it was sort of like a bolt hole. And it was, you would run into people, you know, they found one another there. And so you wind up with first comes from uh, Europe, escaping the Chateau Marmont, European pension. Jean Harlow, who was sort of the, uh, a, the 1930s, a sex pot in the Marilyn Monroe vein. Um, being on, she was about 22 years old. It was her third marriage. During the honeymoon, having affairs with other men, including Clark Gable, her frequent co-star. Um, again, that could happen because there was war. There were cool about things like this. If you were at a, a hotel with more public areas, so it it catered to that crowd who wanted to be near the game, but you know, in in a private. It hasn't changed that much. I mean, I think that that reputativeness and also kind of an insider's place really has stayed the same all the way up until this day. So that that was the way it was, that they didn't have kind of the massive amount of like whatever kind of you know, that. And then what developed after like the 30s? How did Mormont continue in its development? Um, Alfred Smith added some... Uh, Bungalow, um, what had you know, the, up around the hotel, um, started to be populated by these bungalows. So he incorporated some of the bungalows into the property. And so you had like privately private place. You were in building. You didn't have to go through it at all. The amenities of a hotel, you know, this. Um, the next owner, Matt Tower, put in the hired more bungalows and built a couple of bungalows. So um, there was one other bungalow addition in the 1970s, and that's it. You have a building with 41 rooms, and you have 22 rooms. Gosh, right. you know? And it's actually a big... I mean, it's surprising yeah. that... There to, uh, you know, 
but the remember the tiny ones the studio i mean a small manhattan sitting area with kids in the tiniest room in this place so the units are bigger than the building in a certain sense the building looks like it would house a lot more units but because mm-hmm. of the amount of space some of the there are several those things are like 3600 square feet Huge, that's like yeah. two feet that's two yeah. you know? Right. And so how did how did like the continued development during World War Two and post war and can you talk about some of the more famous people hiding there? Cower, who I mentioned, um he ruled over the, the hotel from the, until the early nineteen sixties. We became what we think of. Um uh, an anti he actually funded the political opposition to Adolf that's an anti fascist <laughs> you know if you're banking the guy hitler i got to say you're um and he came to america uh, he started buying apartment buildings he was a banker he had a phd in he believed in small d democracy human freedom and civil rights Decided that Chateau Marmont would be accepting of, um, not anything goes, but like with you know respect and dignity, you'll be and you would have your privacy, but you also didn't carry on. He let you know. In forty-eight, became a hate. And Anthony Perkins, the, and began a couple of That's where Nicholas Ray made Rebel Without a actor who was sleeping with his underage male and female co stars, uh, Nat and Sal Min- preying on them. Um, that's who had children, these children. Um, but during that time, you know, he turned, he, he lived there for eight years and he made movies while he was there, including Rebel Without a Cause. And one of the ways that movie came about was Chateau Marmont was in the Hollywood and screenwriter. pool in Nick Ray's bungalow. He created a milieu there. Um, during this same time, actors started to come from New York. Marlon basically consummated their romance. Newman was a married man with three children when he met Joanne Woodward, and she was where they, um, they, they acted on this passion that had developed between them and was the so it was always fascinating characters. Tell on the west side, actually, and that meant jazz musicians started to stay there. Dixie, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, Duke Ellington was at, at amazing story to happen in twenty years. Yes, there's tons of movies you talk. The book that are they're in separate so Butch Cassidy, all these screenwriters. You know, the the other secret was that it was cheap. People knew where you were staying, but you weren't money, so you could stay there for months. I mentioned Nicholas Ray stayed in a bungalow for eight years. It was his home. Um, people would go there and write two screenwriters nine months um rooms on retainer and they kept car rick de niro did that for years in the 19th 19- um he in there that was his i think they could get permission from him to use it for other you know you know a-list guests of their 63 rooms they dedicated one to this guy wow that's incredible 
it wasn't oh i mean the of the hotel itself there were definitely but definitely some decent k oh. elements well i mean if it's particularly some zoning to change there was going to be a freeway built through Hollywood connecting the bay on um, Southern California stretch of La Cienega through the Baldwin Hills that feels like a freeway. That was part of that projected freeway. And it would come right past, right up Laurel Canyon. And that land would have been worth a lot more. It would have been a freeway interchange. Um, and I was some, aware of that. Yes. We could have replaced Chateau Marmont, but through these guys didn't invest in the hotel at all. It was being used. Um, also, the rise of rock and roll, the Sunset Strip had all the rock bands on it. So in, in addition to the movie clientele and, and the people from advertising and fashion who always come on, you start these people. Rock and roll brings in a, there's just a whole nother level of debauchery going. You know, or it's fueled. It's fueled. You know, stronger than booze and and right. you know. You get um, Led Zeppelin staying there. They didn't drive motorcycles. There is no lobby. That that happened. Set marquee. Um, like a, a lot of. Yeah. yeah. yeah right. Um. Yeah, during this time, the hotel got grungy. And it was still cheap, cheap like for a reason, like in your hands. You know, you turn the shower on and the knob would come. So, tear it down. A builder, a guy from Starlot, um, this building was on the auction block. 66 and the reserve wasn't met like that's how that's how low in, in esteem it was at that time um that's incredible. about 10 years after that there's still like it turns through a series of four makeshift corporations with um you know one-time deal to tell and see if they could sell it or tear it down and it went through being divorced, he moves in. It's like a bachelor pad. It's Armand for being the place kicked out of the house. And he falls in love with the place and he decides he's going to restore it. And he kind of shores it up and saves it from rack and ruin. It had been neglected. You know, it was never luxurious under Sarlot, but it was still a cheap and it was saved. He, you know, he, he, he he was like the ER the thing alive. Um, but during and that time, the Polanskis continue. are staying there. And they, they um into Cielo Drive because Sharon Tate doesn't want to bring a... She dies there. Uh, he's been staying, carrying on for, for weeks, months, using hard drugs. Uh, abusing his body, abusing his career, and no one can stop. Um, so, so you know, Sarlat saw a lot going to maintain some of the ideals that the hotel has always had of of tolerance and discretion. Gotcha. And so, what's the true story of Jim Morrison on the uh, on the roof or on the balcony? Oh, you know, there is a true story. That's one of learned in this book, like the day or two after this happened, there was an article about in the LA Times telling this story. That's totally credible to me. And, you know, Jim Morrison got kicked out of the riot house, this house down the street, um, which had been built by Gene Autry, the cowboy star. He would be on upper floor, one balcony to another, uh, very high, drunk, um, on LSD, out of his skull, and he would do that on Boulevard. This was a time, by the way, he'd run out into traffic with his coat and like be a mad 
Sunset Boulevard. Um, so he gets back to Marmont. He's in a bungalow that has an upstairs and a downstairs. Same trick. In great shape, and you know, something came loose, or he lost his grip. At any rate, he fell, and he hit little um, Eve, the little over the doorway, and then garden below it, and he wound up, you know, injured, but, oh, you know, didn't break oh, his neck. Did. Yeah, yeah, and then two days later, this guy who was at the party saw this thing. The other Jim Morrison is still a reporter for the LA, you know, in, in, in a historical true <laughs> gotcha and so i mean it, it was so it went through kind of a downward phase and then there was a reascent these uh well in the 70s marson's gotcha. uh, belushi's 83 you know some some uh roman polanski stayed there again uh after sharon tate's murder when he was um about to flee uh his sentencing and his, his, the charges that he his charges are still open against him for. Yeah, I think he's a convict. He's a he's yeah, a he, convict. he's he just fugitive. Sense. Yeah, for time, but um, not all of the time. He probably um, under the. Mm -hmm. That was the last before he fled the country. Oh, um, interesting. And Sarlat owns this place. 1990 ish, and then he sells it. He and his partner are splitting up their hotel for 15 years. He had other, yeah, but he he rescued it. Then he sells it to a guy, the current owner, owner Andre Bala, who's the heir to a biomedical fortune uh, made by his Hungarian dad, who you know made and. And he's kind of like. Balaj is a man about town. He, uh, his wife of Ford, uh, heir of the Ford modeling business and fortune. So he was in the fashion world, in politics as a young man, then learned a nightclub owner. And then years he's been engaged to Uma. Chelsea Hamlet with his wife Balaj is 60s his wife is about 30 they have a baby who's about um he you know he he, he his million dollar apartment and he says basically it's just a story so he's getting nice. rid of it yeah. so and his his thing is, um, he's you know, their hotels, the Mercer Hotel in Manhattan, still owns um, the hotels in London and on Long Island. He has owned other, the Standard Hotel chain, kind of hipster, high end, Los Angeles, New York, Miami. He he helped found those, and that company is no longer part of it. Chateau Marmont up. If you walk into Chateau Marmont today, it is gorgeous. Of a heyday that it never actually has. Like you are Lee to come around the corner. Um, it, it, all time, it feels luxurious, but it never was luxurious. He's pulled off this feet of press you know your scene her existed but it's beautiful and it's tasteful and it existed built it as a luxury hotel he put in a restaurant he got the first liquor license he started hosting parties and poetry readings book launches and art shows it's the place to go to get your makeup on oscar night or get your hair done before the grammys because you know certain uh, certain beauty uh, concerns, all floors of it, award season, 
you know, and it's, it's expensive. It, Nick Ray, Ray years tonight. Tonight, if you was um, a pre-pandemic, wow. there's no way this. The Bohemians have been priced out. Bohemians, but it's not the same. And it's a, it, it's a great job that he did. He made it lucrative. He made it a global brand. Sold off some of the heritage to get to that level. It's there only as um, uh, it's it, it's a best live. Like a, a yeah, spectral. Yeah. But uh, is it turn it into a private club or turn it into some type of? Yeah, you know, he he's had a it? really lousy year press wise. He responded to the pandemic. It's a privately owned hotel, so we don't know. Um, used it and back in March discussion that he fired them because there were quirks of California labor laws and the unions he's trying to some people say he's trying to break the union at any rate he let everybody go there are a few long term guests who have been bubbled quarantined in the hotel increased over the um, but most has hired back a portion of the workforce, but there were people for like 30 years. And, you know, in a hotel with that devoted a clientele, something. A lot of people got, got angry with him. He, he botched that. Then he announced, and tone deaf, in the middle of the economic hardship and, and uncertainty that we're all living through, he announced that he was going to basically turn shares you would be a, the only way you could stay in the hotel would be if you were a member of the hotel um there would still be public play sure there would be a certain number of rooms uh, tina brown or tom Cruise jones wants to say at chateau marmont but um in, in the main private people now as i say it's super the smallest room in the place is probably about, you know, pre, you know, a year ago would have cost you about a night, maybe $500 a night. And that would be for like, and rooms, but not as big around you. That's for sure. Um, and, you know, basically turned it into a anyhow. Um, right. There Except, you know, there could be new people coming in, and it's a way for him to generate income when the hotel business is completely flatlining. Um, to really, he's, he's that at the same time, fighting employees in, in the legislature and in the courts about unionizing and getting back wages and having against employers who are so capricious so it's a really poor response that that gotcha. announcement and it remains to be seen if people will do it um you know i'm sure there are people with money to throw away who, who would like to stay at chateau marmont but uh they may not feel the same when they see how behaved about it of the marmot, you know, whether they don't able to form it, but development, there's yeah. higher end things. So, storm torn down in like 1960, replaced with a kind of modern. Standing up for God destroyed. The only f was a model of the place in the lobby of the bank, and now wow. someone's built modern uh, Frank Gehry tower with entertainment in the lower floors and rooms reaching up into the sky. 
night, and the preservationists stood up for the mid-century. Wow. So, it into the design for that building, but it's that shows you how long. Seriously, they may not have the 1960s they do today, and uh, I so because of that, you know, Chateau Marmont's a registered landmark of the city, um, and it's always it has done with it that none of the previous Sarlat saved it from falling apart. Brand. Turn it back into a hotel. If we know anything about this place, it's adaptable. It's an apartment building. Now it's luxurious. You know, yeah. it, they added to it, uh, you know, a, a bona fide built on the double poured concrete because of. of um, and it wound up all. I think part of your book. Little surviving one of the. Early like that, so. Yeah, yeah. There are stories of, you know, because when an earthquake. Out of town or something. It's <laughs> an earthquake. that you'd like to end up on or anything you would like where can people find your book and copies do you have a website um yeah i have a website sean levy s-h-a-w-n-l-e-v-y dot com not the stranger things and and all that stuff every day i am um okay. and all barnes and noble on, you know, um, Indie Bound is where you can buy them from little bookstores near you. Face, it's a nice thing. I think we learned in this year businesses mean a lot to us. Um, um, sure. Worth noting also that this book is um, in development at uh, Paramount Television under the production back. In this world of oh, that gets uh, green lighted, and we can watch that on. I mean, this would be a good uh, intro to that future show. And do you have yeah. any projects in the future you'd like to? It's still kind of hush. Uh, no, no, I, I, I'm working on two books that'll be released in 2021. One is a poems from a Portland, Oregon publisher where I live, um, based on a year's worth of their organizations and who knews and, you know, that was 26 and that was the year we lost and Arnold Palmer and Bowie, David Bowie and Leonard Cohen uh, and, um, Glenn, Fidel Castro it was a really rem Prince. It was a year, and so it's a bunch of mini biographies. And for Doubleday, a history of pioneers of stand-up comedy. So, Mazels. Great. Well, that sounds great. Uh, I'll keep an eye out for that. So, Sean Levy, and the book is "The Castle on Sunset: Life, Death, Love, Art, and Scandal." at Hollywood's Chateau Marmont. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much for your interest. All right, Sean. Take care. Have a good one. Let's see, are you still there?